Hello everybody. My name is Dan Hamill Williams. I'm better known in Oklahoma as Danny Williams, which is someone that I made up. When I got into the media, I decided that what I would do was, if I saw somebody that was successful, I would try to emulate their personality so that everybody would like me. Well, it worked for a while, but it didn't work forever because I found that as I went along in television that I had one particular talent. People either liked me a lot or they hated me. But I also found out that if you're gonna be, quote, a star, that means that you're well known, that people have to have both opinions of you. Some people watch you to see you mess up. Some people like you because they like what you do or they think you're crazy or whatever, but both kinds of people watch. The people who want to see you mess up and the people who want to see you do well. I went to the University of Texas after serving in the Navy during World War II. When I got out of the Navy, or when I graduated from the University of Texas, I went to San Antonio and interviewed at a station called KTSA. I'd been telling kiddie stories on the radio and doing a lot of voices, and I told Cinderella to this guy, program director at this station, and he hired me the same day. When I went to work for him, he put me on as a morning disc jockey, and in the afternoon I had a show called Uncle Dan's Storytime. This was at KTSA in San Antonio. Well, it was really a big break because I really had a lot of audience, and another thing, I got to doing birthday parties for $10 a pop and made more money doing the birthday parties as Uncle Dan as I did working on the radio. Another big break that I had is one afternoon I'm doing a, at the, the station in San Antonio was owned by a newspaper called the San Antonio Express. And they always had people from UPI and AP, those are news wires, come in and visit and this guy from United Press International came in and watched my show. Well, we went out after the show to have a few beers and play some pool, and the guy really liked me, and so he came to Oklahoma City, and he told him that there was a guy in San Antonio they ought to hire for television, that he was different, had some talent, and he would be very entertaining for their TV station. Well, the first thing I know, I get a call from Oklahoma City and the guy says, how would you like to work in TV? Well, I'd been to college for three and a half years, graduated with honors, unbelievably, and the whole time I was at the University of Texas, I never heard one thing about television. And as soon as I graduated, about a year and a half after that, I'm in TV in Oklahoma City. Well, Oklahoma City had a kid's show called Gizmo Goodkin. What they had was they had a little puppet and they had the wires up in the upper structure and they strings and this puppet would, you know, he'd do that. And I was Pavanaugh Spoofkin, chief spoof spinner of Spoofkin Land. What I would do on the show is I'd tell kitty stories and Basil Lowry, an artist here in town, would draw pictures to go along with my story. Well, I don't know why it was a success, but it was a real success. And it was pretty funny too, because one afternoon, while we were doing a show, Gizmo dropped the whole apparatus for the puppet that fell down there, and I happened to say, just on the ad lib, like I do a lot of times, things just come to my mind. I said, look out, the sky is falling. And we had all these kids in the peanut gallery. They ran through the camera, ran here and there, and the whole place went nuts. I mean, completely nuts. Well, I guess the program director then thought I had potential for idiocy. So they sent me on a Friday night with the mobile unit to Stockyards Coliseum to do the wrestling. Well, I'd never seen a wrestling match, didn't know anything about it. Went out there, made up all these holes and all this stuff, and they had one of these deals where the good guy gets knocked out of the ring he finally climbs back in and the referee goes one, two, three, and the bad guy wins. 
Well, the audience went completely nuts. They said, this is the biggest fakey deal. I'll never come back here again. Why well, I can't believe you people do all this. You know, all oh, this. And they went crazy, and I thought, man, I got this show and lose it on the first deal. Well, the funny thing about it is, the next Friday night, the same people are sitting in the same seats, watching the same thing, going as crazy as they did. Because you see, the wrestling matches, are, people don't go to see the good guy win. They go to see the bad guy get that, you know, beat out of him. Well, anyway, the wrestling, I went on uh, wrestling, they started syndicating it across the South. And I was with the wrestling till about 1973. And when I would travel in the South, and like in New Orleans or Birmingham or Florida, places like that, they'd say, hey, look out for flying chairs, because that was the way I closed the show. Because one of the things they do in the wrestling matches, after the matches, the guys go at one another. And I mean, they really put on a show. Well, one night after the show, Angelo Zavoldi, and uh, I can't remember the guy's name right now, they were getting into it, and I got hit with a chair. So after that, <laughs> I would close the show by saying, watch out for flying chairs. And everywhere I went in the South or anywhere in Oklahoma, they would say, look out for flying chairs because of that deal. Well, the wrestling lasted until 1973, and then WKY canceled it because they didn't like the people that came to see it. The most popular show on TV at that time during the daytime was the TP show with Tom Paxton, a real talent, who had been a big star in San Francisco, Dallas, and even been in the movies. Well, they put me on that show and changed the name of it to Danny's Day. Well, I was pretty lucky once again because a girl came in and auditioned. Her name was Linda Scott. What a pretty young lady, very pretty. And the great thing about her was she had been educated in Mexico and she knew nothing about American culture. And she would come up with some of the dangest answers and perspectives you ever saw. And different perspectives and everything are always funny. And people who can't speak your language very well, that is really funny. Well, she was on the show for four years. Well, after Linda left, we auditioned, and 125 women applied for the job. One of them was a girl named Mary Hart, who had finished 10th in the Miss America pageant. She was from South Dakota, smart as a whip, good looking, and she goes to work for me, and after about a week working with me, I had to call her back to the dressing room and tell her, look, you've got the job. You know, just be yourself. Because for a while, she tried to be everybody but herself. But she learned how to be herself. And as history will tell you, she was 25 years on Entertainment Tonight, which is pretty good when you get right down to it. After Mary left, we had Carrie Robertson a while. Carrie Robertson is one of the most talented humans I've ever known. But I, Terry, and, Terry and I didn't get along as well as we should have for one reason and one reason only. Terry could sing and dance and she had been in all the musical shows in Oklahoma City, but she would not perform on the show. She'd interview, but she didn't want to perform. Well, I'm the kind of guy that thinks that when you go in front of people, you're supposed to give them all you got. So we had a little bit of problem, but she did well and she does well today. She's on her own and she makes motivational speeches all over the world. I, I want to digress a moment and tell you probably the funniest thing that ever happened to me, and this happened like in 1950. 1950, when I was doing this show where I interviewed the pioneers that came to Oklahoma, I would break it up at halfway with kids from elementary school, sort of like the Park Link Letters House Party. So if you have these kids on one day, they're from like Midwest City, they're from like the kindergarten, and first grade. And I have this little kid on and I ask him one of my stock questions. What does your daddy do? And the kid says, he's in Korea. I knew a lot of it at that time in 50. They sent a lot of people to, to, to Midwest City, sent the men folks overseas and left the families there. 
And I said, well, that's really great. Your daddy's not at home, so you get to sleep with mama. I said, I used to sleep with my mama when you're little. It's really great. Well, I got real lucky uh, in 1959. No, it wasn't 15. I was earlier than that. The Russians put Sputnik up in the air. About the time the old lady show got canceled, Hoyt Andres, the program director of the TV station, said, no, I said, you're not going to leave here. I said, we want you to go on the air on Monday afternoon. You're going to be Dan D. Dynamo, 3D Danny from outer space, and you're going to be able to tune in Earth. You're going to be able to go backward and forward in time. And said, it's going to be an hour, and you'll be great. And I said, have you lost your mind? I said, are you kidding me? Well, about two weeks later, we go on the air on a Monday afternoon. I'm by myself, I've got a TV set and a smock like a scientist wears. And I go on at four o'clock and I'm on till five. So I've got an hour, I've got eight minutes of cartoon and 15, 52 minutes to fill. And I made up everybody in the world, invisible characters, everything. Well, when I got off, everybody says, that's terrific, it's terrific. Well, they built me a really fabulous set. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful sets that ever happened. And they made me a robot out of, uh, I don't know what it was, but he was real popular. And, you know, as I talk about my television career, I think about all the breaks that I've had in my life. I mean, I'm telling you about 3D Danny and how the Sputnik and the science thing got started at that time, which was lucky. And I told you, I didn't tell you this, but I was offered a job to go to Philadelphia and then go to work for NBC on Saturday morning. Well, WKY hired Foreman Scuddy out of Tulsa, Steve Powell, a really super guy, good actor, good looking, nice guy, to go to work on Danny's day. I mean, 3D Danny. Well, once Foreman Scotty came, I put him up front on the show. I was writing the show. And I became all these other characters, which I loved playing. I mean, I really loved. I mean, I wasn't very good, but, you know, I'd be king this and that and just had a heck of a time. Well, Mickey Mouse is getting ready to come on the air, and it's going to be a big rating threat. So I had the idea of getting two motorcycles. We put Foreman Scotty's logo on one, mine on the other, and we would drive over to the playground at recess in the morning and the afternoon and say hi to all the kids. Well, let knock them out that 3D and Foreman Scotty would come to their school. We would also do performances at auditoriums by little scientific deals, you know, where you put the banana in the bottle and you put a match in there and it goes and all kinds of goofy stuff like you can take a board, you can take a board and put it on a table and put a piece of paper, just a piece of paper on top of the board and you can go like this and the board will crack. I mean the, the paper will keep it from cracking. We do all this funny stuff and those kids thought we were Einstein for crying my sakes. Of course that's kind of, that's kind of cruel because Kids are easy to fool, and I've always wanted something easy, okay? But anyway, we did real well with that show, and then I uh, was invited to become the morning disc jockey on the radio station. Well, I left Woman Scotty, and I missed it so bad, I cannot tell you how much I missed it. So Foreman Scotty's running out of material, and he asked me to come on the show one afternoon and play an old man. So there comes Xavier T. Willard. Hi, Foreman Scotty. I'm Xavier T. Willard. Yes, I was dropped on a plane out of a wagon back in 22. And I was found by Nakaho Indians. And really, they saved my life. Well, anyway, he became a big character on the show and people really loved him. I do want to say something about the wrestling uh, that many people ask me all the time. People think wrestling is fake. Well, let me say this. 
It's not as fake as some people think, and it's not as real as some other people think. These people have to be in excellent condition. They have to be tougher than a boot. And I'll tell you something else. If you can tell me how to fake blood when the camera's running without stopping it, I'll put in with you, because you can't do that. We had some of the greatest wrestlers ever. We had the great Bolo, who was a, a national guy. We had, I used to have gorgeous George, Georgie Penn, he was something else. Angelo Ciboldi, we had the assassin. The assassins one night got in the ring with, I can't remember who, oh, it was the Haystack Muldoon. And they hit Haystack right here on the cheek. They hit him 19 times with a chair, and the blood is flowing like, I mean, it's, you know, the, the blood factory at the heart hospital. I mean, I thought they had killed him. And what happened was, the reason I know that is when he got out of the ring, I had to interview him, and he's bleeding all over my white shirt. And it was unbelievable, it was brutal. And speaking of brutal, one other thing I need to tell you, and I'm not in any way knocking this guy or putting this guy down, but Steve Powell, who played Foreman Scotty, is one of the nicest people I ever met in my whole life. He was a pure professional. He was ready to go to work when it came time to go to work. He knew his lines, he knew what to do. But we used to fake fights all the time because one of the things you do with kid shows like an adventure is you always end with a hero he's in real bad trouble. So the way we would do it is like his back would be to the camera there and I'd be here and he would hit me and hit my hand like that so it'd make a noise. I cannot tell you the number of times that he hit me right here <laughs> in the jaw and it hurt because Foreman Scotty was six foot three and a pretty good man. But he was a great guy, a terrific guy. Because Foreman Scotty, believe me, friends, because Foreman Scotty came along after there were more TV sets, Foreman Scotty was more popular than 3D Danny. Because when 3D started in Oklahoma, there weren't but about, oh, 20,000 TV sets. And when Foreman Scotty was on, it was up into the 50 and 60,000. Everybody, I want to thank you very much for listening to all of this. And I want to thank you for your support through the years because without you, I'd be nothing. So, te amo, pasalo, I love you, pass it on.